All right, hello again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, and I've been going over a series of video presentations for the Rankin Technical College AWD Application and Web Development 1111 .NET Framework with Web Databases class. The main book we are scheduled to use for the class is ASP.NET MVC with Entity Framework and CSS by Lee Naylor. A well-written book with a lot of great code in it, but I, I believe lacking at times um, as far as the explanations. Now, I'm not saying all of them. Some of them are explained very well, some of the code, code snippets. So I've decided instead to first go over chapters 1 through 9 and 14 through 16 of the textbook Professional ASP.NET MVC 5 by John Galloway and others. I am in chapter 6 and I am up to about page 147, so almost halfway through, and we're getting into looking behind the annotation curtain. So the author says here, before looking at how to work with validation errors in your controller and views, and before looking at building a custom validation attribute, understanding what's happening behind the scenes is worthwhile. The validation features of ASP.NET MVC are part of a coordinated system that involves the use of model binders, model metadata, model validators, and model state. <clears throat> As you were reading about the valid validation annotations, you might have asked a couple of obvious questions. When does validation occur? How do I know if a validation failed? By default, ASP.NET executes validation logic during model binding. As discussed in Chapter 4, the binder runs implicitly when you have parameters to an action method, like this. All right. You can also explicitly request model binding by using the update model or try update model methods. We looked at that in Chapter 4 as well. After the model binder is finished, updating the model properties with new values, it uses the current model metadata and ultimately rather obtains all the validators for the model. The MVC runtime provides a validator to work with data annotations, and that's the data annotations model validator, which can find all validation attributes and execute them, the validation logic inside. Model binder, as it says, catches all the failed validation rules and places them into the model state. The primary effect of model binding, as mentioned there, is model state. Model state contains what did work and what didn't work. So in other words, as it says here, not only does model state contain all the values a user attempted to put into the model properties, but all the errors associated with each property, if any exist. And then when you run the model state dot is valid, if there were errors, it returns false. If there were no errors, it'll return true. So the author says here, again, this is page 148. As an example, imagine the user submits a checkout page without providing a value for last name. With the required validation annotation in place, this will now return false. Says you can also look in model state to see the error message associated with the failed validation. Of course, you rarely need to write code to look for specific error messages. You're typically just saying, did it work or did it not work? Right? And they mention here, just as the runtime automatically feeds validation errors into the model state, it can also automatically pull errors out of the model state. As discussed back in Chapter 5, the built-in HTML helpers use model state to change the display of the view model in a view. For example, it says the validation message helper displays error messages associated with a particular piece of data by looking at the model state. You've already seen this. The only question a controller action generally needs to ask is this. When you're all done, was the model state valid, meaning the dot is valid returns true, or a model dot is valid 
So model that is model state that is valid if it returns true or it returns false. Controller actions and validation errors, which starts on the bottom of page 148 and goes on. As it says there, controller actions can decide what to do when model validation fails and what to do when it succeeds. In the case of success, generally the steps are taken to save or update the information for a customer. So for instance, if uh, the idea is you want to add a product to a shopping cart and if it succeeds, the product is added. When validation fails, an action generally re-renders the same view. So, you know, you're given an error message and you bring the view back up again. The address and payment action shown here and on the next page show that. So here it's if it's valid, you want to do all this stuff. Otherwise, just display the errors. You redisplay the view along with the errors that were in there. And as mentioned here on page 149, the code checks the is valid flag of the model state immediately. The model binder will already have built an order object and populated the object with values supplied in the request, posted from posted form values rather. Now, as mentioned on the top of page 150. There are many variations of this theme, okay? So, I mean, this can be done in a variety of ways, but bottom line is pretty much, regardless of the way you're doing it, it's going to work pretty much the same way. All right. I'm still very early, so let's see if we can finish this. And uh, we've got about seven or eight more pages. Custom validation logic, middle of page 150. The extensibility of the ASP.NET MVC framework means that an infinite number of possibilities exist for implement for the implementation of custom validation logic. This section focuses on two scenarios, packaging validation logic into a custom data annotation and packaging validation logic into the model object itself. Putting validation logic, logic into a custom data annotation that means you can easily reuse the logic across multiple models. Of course, you have to write the code inside of the attribute to work with different types of models, but when you do, you can place the new annotation anywhere. On the other hand, adding validation logic directly to a model object often means that the logic itself is easier for you to write. I would say easier for you to look at, and, and let's just say validate by looking at it, and thus, you can more easily make assumptions about the state or shape of the object. You'll see both approaches in the following sections, starting with writing a custom data annotation, which is next, starting on the bottom of page 150 and going on to 151, 152, 153 to the top of page 154. So the author says here on the bottom of the page, imagine you want to restrict the last name of a customer to a limited number of words. For example, you might say that 10 words are too many for a last name. You might also decide this, that this type of validation is something you can reuse with other models in the music store application. Well, you know, one of the things that you're always looking to do here is to be able to reuse code when possible. So here the validation logic, as they say, is a candidate for packaging into a re reusable attribute. All the validation annotations, like required range, etc., ultimately derive from the validation attribute base class. The class is abstract and lives in the system.componentmodel.dataannotations namespace. Your validation logic will also live in a class deriving from validation attribute. So here's where they're showing it. This is how you would basically create it. Now, none of the logic's inside yet, but you create a new class, you give it a name, and that class, the colon validation attribute, means that that class inherits from the class named validation attribute. 
To implement the validation logic, the author says here, you need to override one of the isValid methods provided by the base class. Overriding the isValid version Taking a validation context parameter provides more information to use inside of the isValid method. So you can see that right here we've just added this. Inside of here. The first parameter it says right there to the isValid method is the value to validate. If the value is valid, you can return a successful validation result. But before you can determine whether or not it's valid, you'll need to know how many words are too many. You can do this by adding a constructor to the attribute and forcing the user to pass a maximum number of words as a parameter. And that's what they're doing here. Now that you've parameterized the maximum word count, you can implement the validation logic to catch the error. So we just did that. And we can say if it's not equal to null, all right, so we only want to do this if there's something in there. But if there's something in there, we want to check. And after we split it based on blanks between, between the words, one or more blanks, we want to keep count. And if it's greater than, after we do that, if it's greater than 10, we want to just return an error message. Otherwise, we want to return success. Now, the author says here, this is the middle of page 152, it says you are doing a relatively naive check for the number of words by splitting the incoming value using the space character. So in other words, this could be a lot more refined than it is. It's actually done fairly simplistically. The problem with the last block of code is the hard-coded error message. Developers who use data annotations will expect to have the ability to customize the error message using the error message property of the validation attribute. To follow the pattern of the other validation attributes, you need to provide a default message to be used if the user doesn't provide a custom error message and generate the error message using the name of the property you are validating. So if you notice here, here's the default. And that's where they're checking. There are two changes in the preceding code. First, you pass a default error message to the base class constructor. Second, notice how the default error message includes a parameter placeholder 0, which exists because the second change, the call to the inherited format error message method, will automatically format the string. Top of page 154 here, a custom attribute is one approach to providing validation logic for models. As you see, an attribute is easily reusable across a number of different model classes. In Chapter 8, which is on AJAX, we will add, a, add client-side validation capabilities for this max word, words attribute. All right. And... Next, we've got the iValidatable object. A self-validating model is a model that knows how to validate itself. A model object can announce this capability by implementing the iValidatable interface, as we've done right here. Here's an example 
that does the same kind of thing that we talked about before, where it does a check to see if there's too many words. Okay, but if you look up here, it says here it has three notable differences right here from the one that we the attribute version that we looked at previously. Number one, the method the MVC runtime calls to perform the validation is named validate instead of is valid. The return type parameters are different. The return type for validate is an I enumerable validation result instead of the single validation result because the logic is basically validating the entire model and might need to return more than a single validation error. Finally, no value parameter is passed to validate because we're inside of the instance model of the model or method of the model. And therefore, we can refer to the property values directly. Now, the author says on the bottom here, notice that the code uses the C-sharp yield return, which is a little different. I have not worked with that. But you can see it right here. We use that return syntax to build the enumerable return value. All right. And the code needs to explicitly tell the validation result the name of the field to associate. Many validation scenarios are easier to implement using this type of approach, particularly scenarios where the code needs to compare multiple properties on the model to make a, vi a validation decision. All right. I'm up to 17 minutes. I think I'm going to stop here. I've got about five pages left, but just to make sure I don't run over too much, so I'll come back with the last part of this lesson momentarily.